The Houston Texans opened their preseason schedule with a loss against the Chicago Bears, but there was some good and some bad in their first preseason game in Ohio. You are Locked On Texans, your daily podcast on the Houston Texans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday installment of Locked On Texans, your daily podcast covering your favorite football team in the Houston Texans every single day. As always, I'm your co-host, Cody M. Davis, and joining me today, because John has something else planned today, we brought in... Your country cousin? I was going to say your country cousin, but hey, what's going on, y'all? Big Sarge, man. How y'all doing tonight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And on this Friday installment of Locked On Texans, Big Sarge and I, we will recap the Houston Texans preseason loss against the Chicago Bears that took place Thursday night, which was the second time that they had an opportunity to be featured in the Hall of Fame game, the first time since 2002. And why was they featured in the Hall of Fame game? Because on Saturday, a guy that used to wear number 80 here in the city of Houston is going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Don't know about you guys, Sarge. Don't know about you, but I'm more excited about that. But before we start talking about this Hall of Fame game, guys, I want you to do three things for us. Subscribe, like, and comment to the Locked On Texans podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. But... Houston Texans, they started their preseason schedule with a 21-17 loss to the Chicago Bears. Unfortunately, we would not know if they had a chance to come back in the fourth quarter due to rain. Ended the game midway through the third quarter. However, Sarge, I do believe that we saw enough during the first three quarters to come away with some good and bad. Most of the good came on the offensive side of the ball, and that's why I definitely want us to start with our takeaways from this game. Cody, I cannot believe that Mother Nature robbed us of watching <laughs> Tim Boyle in the fourth quarter. I know. Like, aren't you that so was gonna sad? Be his quarter. <laughs> that was going to be his quarter. Like, he was going to be like, all right, Tim, put it together, guy. You're going to do it. Like, Mother Nature robbed us of seeing <laughs> Tim Boyle on his, uh, on his comeback. You know, he was going to get <laughs> – D'Amico would have walked into the locker room. It was like, this game ball right here mm. is for you, guy. You know, I'm pretty sure that's how he played it out in his head. That's what he's saying. He's like, y'all better be glad. He told the Bears walking out the field, y'all better be glad <laughs> it's the rain. But, Cody, speaking about the offensive side of the ball, I uh, I was very, very impressed by the fact that the that D'Amico Ryans and Bobby Slowick started Juice Scruggs at center and Kenyon Green at left guard. Those are two players who are going to probably be first team start uh first take a lot of first team reps who mm-hmm. will be starters once the regular season starts to go along with Laramie Tunsil, um Titus Howard and Shaq Mason those three players did not play on Thursday night and so it was good I like getting Kenyon back reacclimated to NFL game speed it was good to see Juice Scruggs going into his second year uh next to Kenyon and the one thing that I really liked about that center guard combination is you could see the camaraderie that they built up. We've talked about this before, how those two worked out this summer intentionally. Mm-hmm. Juice Scrugg stayed in Houston intentionally to work out with Kenyon Green to get that type of camaraderie. And you could tell every time they really needed a big player when Davis Mills was really looking for protection, he made sure that he stood behind Hmm. Juice Scruggs and Kenyon Green. There was a time when I think it was fourth and inches. You know, they ran the ball right behind those two. And, you know, why not? You want to make sure that those guys, those two starters, are getting the reps and getting themselves acclimated, like I said, once again, for Kenyon Green to games. So I was very, very, very impressed by Juice Scruggs and Kenyon Green. I'm glad that you talked about the offensive line because the one thing that I love most about this first preseason game is the fact that at least on the offensive side of the ball, a lot of the players that we talked about throughout the first 10 days of training camp was basically shown in this game. Um, You know, you talked a lot about Kenyon Green, Sarge, really quick. Um, Everything that you saw and talked about Green, I I believe it was a week ago, you saw it come, come to light in this game, correct? Yes, and he's healthy. I'm, I'm exactly. glad that he's healthy. And, and one, if I can add one caveat to that, um, 
what he also was a so during practice a lot we see because Blake Fisher um the the rookie tackle Blake Fisher has to go up against either Will Anderson Jr. or Daniel Hunter. We've talked mm-hmm. about that b- before. And sometimes Kenyon has to help him out. There has to he has to help him out sometimes, you know, making sure that his responsibility is done, but to also make sure that he's helping out Blake Fisher to protect CJ Stroud. I think that that trial by fire that Blake Fisher has been going through and on tonight, mm-hmm. we, were, we were able to see him just stick to his responsibility and Blake Fisher hold his own because of who he's going up against and who's gone up against in these first 10 training camp practices. So that's the one thing that I, I, I'm glad I got a chance to focus on was to see Kenyon himself just be able to play hard without doing anything else. And I'm glad that you mentioned that about Blake Fisher because a couple of days ago on this show, me and John was talking, and I said one of the things that I wanted to see in this first preseason game was to, to was to see whether or not all of those tough reps that Blake Fisher is getting in practice right now with Daniel Hunter, with Will Anderson Jr., uh, how much he's going to benefit from that. Remember, I asked Coach D'Amico Ryans about that a couple of days ago, yes. and that's basically what we saw in this very first game. Um one of my biggest takeaways, and I've been talking about this a lot ever since the start of training camp, was how competitive this running back group is. You know, and once again, we already know who the top two guys are going to be. But once you start looking at who's going to be the quote unquote third running back, when you look at Darrell Goomba Wale, um, you look at guys like British Brooks, JJ Taylor, um, Gerard Jordan, all of those guys made a name for themselves throughout training camp. In this very first game, just about all of those guys still made a name for themselves in this very first preseason game. I mean, you take a look at what J.J. Taylor and Darrell Goomba Wale were able to do. They were in this limited of time, they was out there on the field, nine rushes, a combined nine rushes for 30 yards. J.J. Taylor had the, one of the biggest, longest runs for the Houston Texans running between the B and the A gap. And who <laughs> is in the B and the A gap? Kenyon Green and Juice Scrolls for a game, I believe it was 10 or 12 yards. But this game showcased everything that I've been saying about that offensive backfield. And not only are the guys that I've been talking about, Cam Akers went out there and made a, a name for himself as well. And Sarge, I don't know about you, but I'm looking at Cam Akers. First and foremost, we know he was a late addition to training camp. Then his first couple of days of camp, you know, he really wasn't out there outside of individual team drills. So going into this game, there was I wasn't expecting much from Cam Akers. And, and, and secondly, look, first and foremost, like I said a couple of days ago, we talked about his addition. I don't care if he makes this team or not. Kudos to him for coming off not one but two Achilles injury yes. and still trying to keep his career up. Yes. That, that alone is a testament within itself. But for him to go out there, showcase what he can do, look, five carries, 13 yards, and a, 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 a reception touchdown, it says a lot about what Coach D'Amico Ryan said when he was asked, why did you add Cam Akers to this team? And he said, we just want to see if he's going to come out here and compete. Like I mentioned, he's been quiet at the start of training camp. But after this game right here, I'm pretty sure Coach D'Amico Ryan's and Nick Casario thinking to themselves, look, it's still a long shot if he makes the 53-man roster. It's still a long shot if he makes the practice squad roster. But he's definitely going to put some heat on these other guys in a position group that has looked damn good. Speaking of putting some heat, Sarge, listeners and viewers, when the Houston Texans landed, Ben Skoranek, I didn't know what to expect from him. I thought, if anything, special teams guy. And if he wasn't a special teams guy, a practice squad guy. But Sarge, watching him over the last couple of days of training camp and watching him go out perform Thursday night against the Chicago Bears, I'm thinking to myself, that young man is about to shake up this wide receiving unit. And if he doesn't shake up the wide receiving unit, I think he might have an opportunity to shake up the fullback unit as well. I, Cody, we're talking about the Houston Texans wide receiver room, not the I know. Houston Cougars. I know, I know. No, no, Skoranek is not going to shake up anything except protein shakes that he's going to be bringing to Nico Tank. <laughs> uh, when, I say, on. when I say shake up, I'm talking about putting heat on the rest of those guys who are on the bubble. Oh, okay, so l- let me say this. You're talking about Skoranek, mm-hmm. but 
and, and you know, kudos to whatever that you see. He had I, he had one great catch for me, you know, because that's a difficult catch to make when that ball hits your hand like that. He was still able to bring it in, and even though it wasn't for uh, you know many yards, it was a really good catch. But I mean, you think that he put pressure on Xavier Hutchinson, who mm. ended the game with five receptions for fifty six yards, and every time Davis Mills, who by the way looked amazing. Uh, and look, your goat, <laughs> by Davis and Hills, who looked amazing. But uh, every time that he needed someone to make a big catch, who was there for him? Xavier Hutchinson. And, it, it, and I was going to say, Rick, I'm glad that you mentioned Xavier Hutchinson because that was the other name that I was going to add. Because majority of this wide receiver unit, I think, is basically made up. However, when you take a look at what Xavier Hutchinson was able to do, when you take a look at Ben Skarani, you talking about the, the many one-hand catch he had. You must have forgot about the 25, 27-yard reception that he had um, in the first quarter as well. Ben Skoranek has looked good, not only in just the, in this one preseason game, but throughout training camp as well. And I'm just looking at it from a standpoint, the last two sp spots in this wide receiving court is definitely going to be interesting to see how are they going to shake it up because you got somebody like Ben like I mentioned if he doesn't shake it up in the in the wide receiving court I'm pretty sure they're going to find a spot for him when it comes to that fullback unit and he already has the body 6'3 224 pounds a couple days ago coach D'Amico Ryan's already said he loved his versatility and the fact that he can play at several positions on the offensive side of the ball that lets me know that they're definitely going to find a role for him then when you take a look at xavier hutchison now you talk to xavier one-on-one -on -one. can you really please if, if you don't mind sharing can you please tell the listeners and viewers what xavier told you and let us know whether or not you saw him live up to that expectation Xavier, after we finished the after we finished the interview when he was walking away because he said that the one thing that he's coming into camp with is comfortability uh knowledge of the playbook and he's no longer a rookie he said those are the things he said i've really been making sure that i learn to execute these plays make sure that my body is right and then after the interview before he walked away he said mm -hmm. sarge this is gonna be a different year Hmm. He used the, you know, he used an explicitive that I'm not going to use on this family friend, <laughs> this this family friendly show, a friendly family show, however you want to say it. But he said, Sarge, I ain't playing that this year, not this hmm. year. I'm not coming in and, and being. And, and he said that he didn't. He said timid, but he meant timid in the way of I was a rookie. I'm still trying to learn. I'm mm -hmm. learning the NFL all the while learning a new offensive system. He said, I'm not going to be there. He said, this year is going to be a whole different year. I'm about to put some pressure on some people, and I'm about to show what I can really do. And I love that about Hutch, someone that I talked th to throughout the entire season on a consistent basis. And I know that he has the talent. I know that he can do it. And right now, he may get himself caught up in a numbers crunch because of the amount of wide receivers that the Houston Texans have. But what I've seen, to, I've seen a more confident route runner mm -hmm. in Xavier Hutchison. I've seen that he got more comfortable um, in, in being in spots and catching the ball, securing the ball. And then, you know, that one play they gave him last year, <laughs> the mm -hmm. little, receiver in the round yeah he was on that play last year he looked a whole lot better and more comfortable running it into your uh scronic point now if you say that he's going to make the team i will agree with you i just don't agree that he's going to shake up the wide receiver room like he can shake up the fullback room or the special teams room but the wide receiver room i just don't see it in, or in case of emergency break glass right <laughs> hey, look, at the end of the day, man, Ben Skarani, I, I've been impressed. Like I said, I didn't know what to expect from him. I, I, I didn't expect much from, much from yeah. him. I said at best, I just figured he was going to be a special teams guy. But what I've been able to see through the first 10 days of training camp, what I what I saw last night in this preseason game, like, and, and I agree with you, Sar, like this, it's probably, arguably, if not the best wide receiver unit in the league. It's no lower than two. Yeah. But I'm just looking at it from a standpoint, especially as much as we've been around and, and have had an opportunity to talk to D'Amico and talk to Nick Casario. We know, you know, 
what they are thinking in the makeup of how they want to compete and everything. I'm looking at Ben Skarana. I'm like, he is going to be a reason why when the 53 man roster comes out, we're going to be saying, wow, I can't believe that this person did not make it. Look, nine times out of 10, it probably won't be in a wide receiver unit. But once again, I keep going back to Coach D'Amico Ryan said a couple of days ago that he loves his versatility and he could play several positions on the offensive side of the ball. And look, Fullback is going to be used, whether that's whether that's Ben Skoranek or not. He's going to have a place on this team. Ben Skoranek, Xavier Hutchison, um, Davis Mills, Cam Akers, you're talking about some of the brightest spots on the Houston Texans in their very first preseason game. However, when we flip over on the defensive side of the ball, Sarge, I don't know about you, but I was a little bit disappointed. We're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. Passion, drive, patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors have everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Motors guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or your money back. Because eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. And with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP that you're going to bring home with huge wins. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Motors guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday installment of Locked On Texans. As Sarge and myself continue to recap the Houston Texans preseason opening loss to the Chicago Bears 21-17. Sarge, we talked about the offensive side of the ball and basically gave away a lot of positive takeaways. However, it's time for us to switch over to the defensive side. Well, I think those positives will definitely turn into negatives. I do want to say this. I still believe that the Texans are rightfully so, because I think only, what, 5%, 10% of the Texans starters played. I still believe that this could be, arguably, if not the best defensive team in the league. However, I need to make sure, and the Texans need to make sure, and everybody in there in the, on 610 and Kirby need to make sure that everybody that's starting on that defensive side of the ball Never get hurt, <laughs> especially that secondary. I think the defensive line, and when I'm gonna get into, I think the defensive line, you know, can afford if one or two players go down, like you know, the, the Autry, given the fact that he's gonna miss a, the first six games of the season. You know, what I saw, you know, in the first quarter more so, I think the def defensive line they did a pretty solid job showcasing their depth. I mean, Khalil Davis, a guy that I've been high on ever since the Houston Texans signed him and gave him an opportunity. I had accounted him for like two or three pressures. Um, I think the defensive line, even though I don't think they ended the game with a sack, they did do a good job getting after the quarterback. They began the game doing a solid job. I believe those first two offensive drives for the Chicago Bears containing the run. Um, however, that second there, the second and third level of, of this defense, when you look at the reserve unit, was not good. Well, first we got to stop calling it a loss, even though I know it went in as a loss, because we're going to call it the missed opportunity of the Tim Boyle comeback game. <laughs> you you, so, you going to keep bringing that up. <laughs> exactly. Second thing is, Cody, uh, I think that you and I have talked about this on the side. I think that you and I, I, I think that I may have talked about it on the Texas tailgate talk. Um, but it's the second unit, I think it was had to be day eight. I think day eight is when D'Amico was finally fed up with it. Like mm -hmm. that second unit run the run defense. Now, before I even get to the secondary, I'm just gonna talk about the 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 backups playing the or the backups on the defense side of the ball that's supposed to be run stoppers. Cody, it looked ridiculous again tonight. Mm -hmm. It was so, I mean, I'm sorry. It looked ri ri ridiculous on Thursday night. And <clears throat> when you look at the amount of space and holes that these running backs had to run through for the Bears, I'm saying to myself, is anybody going to get close? 
And mm-hmm. even when Khalil Davis tried to get close, he was getting chipped, of course. And he was getting some pressure, but he was getting chipped. But, I mean, it was too many times that the running backs were able to get to the second level. And I'm saying to myself, hey, this looks just like training camp. Mm-hmm. And I said, at some point, I know that D'Amico is going to go back and he's going to say, hey, y'all either get it together or you get gone. You know he is a coach that it doesn't matter whose name is on the back of the jersey. If you're not getting the job done, he will put you on the bench. Now, side note, I never thought that I would see a player like Jalen Petrie last year get benched, but D'Amico didn't care oh, about the, the name on the back of the jersey. Hey, man, if you're not getting the job done, you're not getting the job done. He'll let you all he'll he'll let you know that. So this that 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 backup unit for the, the backup unit defensive unit for the Houston Texans, they have to make sure that they're playing their responsibilities. It seems like too much freestyling out there. It mm-hmm. seems like too much. I'm trying to be this instead of playing cohesive. If you look at that first team defense. They play as a cohesive unit. They move as one. They all move as one. When they pursue the ball, they all pursue the ball. When they go into pass coverage, they all go into, you know, um, and I mean from the linebackers in the secondary, they go into the pass coverage while the front four do what they're supposed to do. Tonight, I just, I mean, Thursday night, I just seen too many things where it was, Okay, so this defensive tackle got some pressure. But what this defensive tackle is doing? Like, are they are they are they, are they not running? The, the, someone not here? The call it just looked ridiculous at certain points, and I'm not going to harp on the fact that they did a bad job because when it was time to make a stop, they made a stop. I was mm-hmm. really impressed by uh, rookie defensive tackle uh, Marcus Harris. Oh, I yeah. like the way I, I like he and I've said this before. He reminds me of a young Malik Collins because of the way he gets off the ball and how physical he is and how much pressure he puts on. But he's just a rookie, you know. So, um, I yeah, Cody, I'm I'm with you when it comes to that defensive unit, that second defensive unit. What about the secondary? The secondary as a whole did not. I would say Kellen Bullock did impress me to start. Hey, can you say that for the people in the back? Oh, I, I I repeat it again. And I know people in the comment section has always said this every time I, I mention this statement that I don't want to see him start and come week one of the regular season. And I still don't. But what I would say that he was the best defensive back on the field for the Houston Texans. However, outside of him, that secondary did not look good. I, I look, I told Sarge told you that Kalen Bullock should start. Sarge told you that Kalen Bullock probably will start because did you see the two play series from MJ Stewart? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you see a missed tackle for the big game, and then go right never, back and blow the coverage but, for but the. I never, but I never said MJ Stewart was good. I've never said that. If anything, like I mentioned, if you have a vacancy next to Jimmy Ward, you got 18, 17, 18 million dollars in, in cap space. You need to bring somebody in. However, I would say Kellen Bullock did surprise me. And I'm looking at it from a standpoint, if you're playing like that in your very first quote-unquote NFL game and you're playing like that with a weakened secondary and you walking off that field as, as the best defensive back that the Texans had, that's saying something about that young man. But what I also would say that outside of Kalen Bullock, they need to do something with the depth of this secondary because nobody, all of those defensive backs, did not look good against the Chicago Bears. And I don't want to take us off the fact uh, of the defensive backs, but if I could side note this thing, Cody, even with that money, they're going to have to look at the, the – hey, listen, the backup offensive lineman didn't look good tonight either. They're going to mm-hmm. have to look maybe at, at – because if one of those starters go down, they're going to have to look at bringing some, some more – uh, offensive lineman in. Not only that, I mean, when Demico Danico Autry is out for six games, the defensive tackle like they have a rotation of defensive tackles, but there's going to be a good defensive tackle that's going to get cut that the Texans could probably take a look at. Now, after that, now I'm saying, okay, you're right. With the defensive backs, they're going to have to. They're, they're definitely going to have to look at, at bringing some someone in. And you and I talked. 
uh, after day nine of the Texas training camp. And one thing, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I pulled you to the side and I said, you know, I think it's his name, Troy Pride Jr. If I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken, I want to make sure I got that right. Troy Pride Jr., I said, Cody, he did not look good in, in, in drills. And D'Amico was standing right there watching him. D'Amico was standing right there, and he kept having to repeat the drill and repeat the drill and repeat the drill. On Thursday night, he kept messing up. Mike mm-hmm. Ford, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I have no clue. Mike, you know what they should do to Mike Ford? <laughs> he should be the guy that carries the radio out. <laughs> <laughs> he should be the guy that carries the radio out at the beginning of the game because he looked lost in the sauce and just the same way with MJ Stewart and MJ Stewart got seven years of experience and you're still missing tackles like that and you're blowing coverages like you may be a great special teams guy but I would hate for the Houston Texans to have to depend on him to make a play my point exactly, and that's why I open up this segment saying I still believe that this could be one of the best, if not the best defensive team in the league, but they cannot afford for no player to go down, especially that secondary. And, I mean, there was moments, and I get it, it was the first preseason game. I mean, the, the Chicago Bears wasn't really playing nobody, but I'm looking at it from a standpoint as many times. I mean, I could go back and probably count on one hand how many times i saw at least a decent coverage from any of those defensive back not named Caleb bullock and Caleb bullock had some moments where he made a mistake but he's a rookie he's his very first quote-unquote nfl game that's what you was that's you know that's what you would expect but at the same time there was so many moments like mike forfoot well what are you doing like really and so I, look I know that that's going to be a point of emphasis for Coach D'Amico Ryans and general manager Nick Casario moving forward. Uh, However, I think there was a handful of players I did want to see in this preseason opener, so we're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. The Houston Texans played their first preseason game Thursday night. However, the sports, they still isn't sporting like I want them to, but FanDuel lets me keep sports going whenever I want. And all I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking all customers up with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. That's something for everyone, every day, all summer long. So head on over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday installment of Locked On Texans. Sarge, once again, man, I understand it's preseason. You know, we love seeing football come back. First of all, look, I don't feel like we had a, an off season. I still feel like we are leaving from Baltimore from the playoff game. <laughs> and I look up, like, it's NFL, it's football season already. Like, the off season this year just went completely fast. And... I'm still in awe about it, but two and most importantly, man, I just cannot wait until tomorrow to finally see Andre Johnson get inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I I still feel like he should have been first ballot, but I get it. I understand it. But to finally see it happen and for him to be the first, man, I love it. And I think I said this on uh, Texans Tailgate Talk, like Andre Johnson – will always be one of my top 10 favorite athletes, period, of all time. We came to Houston together. Yeah, I understand you made the joke that only, you know, nobody cared about when I came to Houston. But he came, he came to Houston in April of 2003. I came in June, you know, and literally to have an opportunity to watch his entire career, man, it, it was something special, man. You know, I, I just can't wait till tomorrow to see You should tell him y'all got here at the same time so he can go for real. That's crazy. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> but if, uh, if I could take a, a, an opportunity to say this is that, you know, watching Andre Johnson, <laughs> Andre Johnson and DeAndre Hopkins, I always use them to in this in this scenario. Of course, you know, I don't think that D Hop has the numbers like, you know, the, the numbers that 
Or he may have the nose, but I don't just don't think that he has the push to be a Hall of Famer. But if you look, they went through similar situations, right? They did. They went through similar situations, and I never got a chance to cover Andre Johnson, but I did get a chance to cover DeAndre Hopkins when he was in Houston. And watching what he had, it didn't matter who was at quarterback. They could have put Pep Hamilton back there at quarterback, and DeAndre would have still, Hopkins would have still caught passes from him. It didn't matter. As long as you threw the ball his way, he was mm. going to catch it. I mean, at one point, I think three or four years of his career, he averaged less than five drops in a year. I think one year I he had that. no drops on the I season. remember that. Right? I think that and was so, 18, if I'm not mistaken. So watching him play, not knowing who was going to be his quarterback until they finally drafted Deshaun Watson at number 12, like then you figured that they were going to have that connection for a very long time. But, you know. Things change. So as I, I I prefaced all that to say that I didn't cover. I covered DeAndre Hopkins. So when I go back and I remember watching Andre Johnson, it's almost like the exact same thing to me. Andre is going to who? It doesn't matter who's at quarterback. Get the ball my way. Hmm. You know the route that I'm running. You know that I'm going to run a great route. You also know that just anywhere in the vicinity is not a defensive back that's going to stop me from catching this pass. There's not a defensive back that's going to knock me off my route. There's not a defensive back that I fear in this league. So no matter who was playing quarterback, and I don't want to call the, the, I don't want to call the, the quarterbacks subpar talent because it takes talent in order to get to the NFL. These quarterbacks just weren't of elite status. These quarterbacks weren't of great status. These quarterbacks weren't on the same page as Hall of Famer wide receiver Andre hmm. Johnson. And so with that being said, for him to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame says a lot because he didn't have what a Jerry Rice had. Hmm, he didn't have exactly. what a Terrell Owens had. He didn't have what a Randy Moss had. He didn't have what a Marvin Harrison had. Like he didn't have what these top wide receivers had. And yet he still is getting a bust in Canton. Hmm. So that says a lot about who he is as a, as a player. And then off the field as a person, he's one of those guys. I, the one thing that I love about Andre Johnson is he, all he, he about that action boss. Hmm. Like he's about action first. Like if you want to have a conversation after we do whatever we're going to do, fine, let's do that. But I'm going to get the job done first. And so watching him being inducted into the pro football hall of fame says a lot, not only for the Houston Texans organization, not only for the Houston Texans fans, but it says a lot about who Andre Johnson is as a player. We should have made this to Andre Johnson. Because oh, <laughs> listen, there's more I want to say, but we we have to continue uh, finishing. Yeah. You know, talking about the the yeah. Texans' um, preseason loss against the Chicago Bears, 21-17, a game that was cut short due to the weather um, midway through the third quarter. But look, we're gonna have an opportunity to see Andre Johnson achieve this amazing feat on Saturday. However, there are a handful of players that we did not see Thursday night. Sars, the number one guy at the top of my list, and it doesn't even have anything to do with his talent. Um, I think it more so it just goes back to a perfect question that you asked coach D'Amico Ryans I believe that was on Tuesday uh, when you asked D'Amico how are you uh, are there certain players I think correct me if I'm wrong but you asked uh, how are you going to use this first game just to you know get the players in the routine of this is when we're going to leave practice on a travel day this is why you need to be at the stadium and you know this is how you get dressed and prepare for a game and this is what you need to do to get ready for um warm-ups and stuff and the number one guy at the top of my list that i wanted to see for those purposes alone is kamari lasseter um and, and i know some people gonna hear that and say well you say he was the second best cornerback in training camp which he is i mean if it wasn't for Derek stingley jr he would be the best defensive back in training camp but you know it's just it's just those small things that you know i just felt like an extra preseason game would would help him because look we all know he's going to be cornerback number two 
starting come week one of the regular season against the Indianapolis Colts. And I don't have the Indianapolis Colts winning the division, I, but I do have them as a potential wild card. And with that quarterback that they got coming back in the small time that we saw him, Kamara yes. Lasseter better and needs to be ready um, in order to perform and help this help this organization stay at least at the top of their respective division. And I just think, man, anytime you have a rookie in his very first game, even if it's just for one drive, one series, just get out there just so you can get the need of it. But, you know, you have an extra preseason game, so I'm pretty sure he probably will finish up the um, preseason, you know, and that way he can finally um, get an opportunity to see what he's really like to prepare for a game. Kamari is at the top of my list and also Titus Howard as well, only because, you know, Last time we saw Titus Howell play football is in November. Yes, he has looked good throughout training camp, but I just want to see him get some reps in the preseason as much as possible so he can actually be ready come week one of the regular season because I just want to see him get his his get back in game shape. And Sarge, I don't know about you, but every single day I've watched him in training camp. It seemed like the only time I, I noticed a mistake out of him I, I, I think to myself, I wonder how much that has to do with him just being fatigued because he's holding his own against Daniel Hunter and yeah. Will Anderson Jr. But anytime there's like one of those subtle mistakes, I just go back. I just wonder if fatigue is playing a role into it, because like I mentioned, I don't think we've seen him since November. For me, Cody, I'm going to say uh, I have three players that I wish would have played tonight that would have gotten a chance to to see just to take some reps because of what they've been through first Damian Pierce I would have mm -hmm. loved to have seen Damian Pierce just to be on the field and see how he's grasping the concept of that offense in the second year up against different competition. I've seen what he's doing, you know, against his own defense and I like what he's doing, even though he's going up against one heck of a defense, I would have loved to see what he looked like against another defense and just see as he, if he's grasping the concept of letting the play develop watching the backside holes um, open up. And so some reps there would have been nice. I would have loved to see Tank Dale go up against just some different competition just so he can get back on the field, get acclimated mm, to being that's hit. That's a good one. Yeah, just, to, just so him to get acclimated to, to being hit, especially after what he dealt with with the season-ending injury and what he went through in the offseason with the incident that happened at the at the club. So mm -hmm. I... I you have to think about it like when he was a rookie, you know, one of the things that he had to get used to in his first game action was being hit. Now that he's been out for so long, he has to get reacclimated to that again. He has to get he has to get used to getting hit again because he has not been hit for months. Mm -hmm. So you got the guys that's on the team that went through the playoff run and all the way through Baltimore. I mean, they're just, a, you know, they're a couple of months removed from being hit or having contact and tank hasn't had contact longer than that. So I'm, I can't wait to see Damian Pierce on the field. I can't wait to see tank Dale. And last but not least, I want to see Jalen Petrie on the field at the nickel position, him playing a position that he's familiar with. I asked him when I got a chance to interview him, had he went back and looked at some of his, uh, college game film from when he was playing in the nickel position. He said, Sarge, I went all the way back to my high school days. He said, I not go back and watch my film a lot. He said, so I want to see how he's going to play in this different position. I also want to see how they're going to use him coming from the safety position to the, to the nickel position. Mm. The Houston Texans will continue their preseason run next Friday against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, they're going to stay in the in the Cleveland, Ohio area um, throughout this following week. Sarge, I know you're going to be out there, um, you know, keeping everybody, you know, updated. So um, as we close this Friday installment of Locked On Texans, please be sure to tell everybody where they can follow all of your work. Because as I just mentioned, I know you're going to be out there with the Houston Texans next week um, in that Cleveland, Ohio area before they go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, so you can follow me um, on the app formerly known as Twitter at Big Star Sports with the Z at the end and on Instagram. Um, I'm on TikTok at Big Sarge Media. Well, the tick and the talk. Hmm. I got to say, like I say it on the tick and the talk at Big Sarge Media. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Big Sarge Media, and make sure you're reading all my articles at www.bigsargemedia.com.
Hmm. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. And please be sure to follow my co-host, John Hickman, at John underscore Hickman 12. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.